All right, guys. So I am very happy to be joined for the first sort of inaugural interview for the Good Politic Guy channel right now. We are joined by Carrie Leiterson from In These Times, who recently wrote a fantastic piece on something that I have been talking about on this channel for months now, and that is the prospects of potentially nationalizing the rail industry here in the United States. Obviously, it is especially pertinent given the recent turmoil and uh, the you know, catastrophic consequences of the Ohio train derailment that we have been tracking on this channel. So I think that this is a perfect time to be talking about something like this. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Carrie to the show. If you'd like to give yourself a quick introduction here, tell people, you know, what you usually cover and where they can find you and all of that good stuff. And then we can get into the, uh, you know, get into the meat of this conversation surrounding this important topic. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, I'm a journalist based in Chicago. Um, I actually teach at Northwestern University. So I'm lucky to work with really amazing students who are interested in a lot of these labor and social justice and environmental justice issues and um, feel really lucky to work with In These Times, awesome magazine where I got to do this story. And um, I also write for Energy News Network, um, some other places too, but uh, do some related stories for Energy News Network as well. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's just go ahead and jump into this. So again, I'll link down Carrie's piece in the description if you guys want to go read it in its entirety highly recommend it because it was a great piece she went super in depth but we're going to try to hit all of the uh high marks in this interview and as uh you know concise of a way as we possibly can so first of all the first question that i would have is basically could you walk us through the last couple of years of this most recent contract dispute between these uh labor unions that represent the rail workers and the you know the rail bosses who have as i've been talking about on this channel basically been trying to sabotage these negotiations been trying to uh you know screw over these workers who have been really just asking for like the bare minimum in these contract negotiations. So how has this sort of unfolded over the last couple of years and sort of bring us right up until the point where the Biden administration decided to step in and sabotage the ability for them to go on strike? Yeah, so it was a very complex um, process. And I'm not going to give you every single twist and turn because yeah. they're not all fresh in my mind. And it's hard to keep them straight. But um, right. uh, basically, I mean, the, the contract negotiations had been going on for a while for the sort of master contract that um, governs the working conditions for the freight railroad workers who are actually represented by 12 different labor unions and who work for um I'll get into this more, I'm sure, later, but uh, there's four major railroad companies and two other Canadian companies that really run the vast majority of the freight in the U.S. So, you know, there's these negotiations for workers with 12 unions um, working for these this relatively small number of companies. And um, uh, traditionally, the, at least to hear the independent um, and more progressive railroad workers tell it, the unions have, you know, really not fought hard for their workers. They've also been pitted against each other by the employers and, you know, seen conditions get progressively worse, especially with the implementation of this thing called precision scheduled railroading, which we can get into more later. Um but basically, uh, so contract negotiations had pretty much stalled. And um, over the summer, there's, uh, I mean, there's a process with rail being considered this crucial industry. Um, it would have been, uh, so there was a vote taken. I'll, I'll, I'll jump ahead and make this a little bit quicker. But um, over the summer, uh, large numbers of, of railroad workers in the um, the engineers union, if I'm getting this right, voted that they would, a vast majority, I think it was 99% actually voted that they would be in favor of a strike um, if the conditions were met that a strike right. would be legal, which it wasn't necessarily a given, but you know that was pretty significant. Um, so then the administration, the presidential administration, um, became part of the negotiations as as mandated by law and, you know, was very invested in avoiding a strike, especially since this was the lead up to the election. And so a deal was negotiated that the um, union uh, leadership agreed to with the administration and the companies. And um, but workers were not happy with that. And right. it, it made some concessions, but it didn't do a lot of the things that they thought were most important, including dealing with this precision schedule 
scheduled railroading and the uh, really uh, <clears throat> draconian and arbitrary kind of scheduling um, right. requirements that that subjected them to. And the fact that they don't really have paid sick days, it didn't really deal with those issues. Um, so uh, in order for this deal to actually take effect, the rank and file of the unions had to also approve it. So each union's rank and file had votes and um, it was sort of an exciting process where one by one, uh, you know, most most of the unions actually did approve it, but some of the unions did not, starting with some of the smaller ones. And um, then the, um, I hope I'm remembering this right again, the engineers actually did vote to approve it, but the conductors, um, the other biggest union voted to reject it. And uh, the unions had a, basically agreed that if one of them was going to strike, they would all honor the picket line, which right. would mean, you know, even one union, um, theoretically, and there were multiple unions, including one of the biggest ones, um, you know, that would mean a nationwide freight strike. Um, so yeah, the Biden administration essentially intervened and um, made it, you know, kind of a crush the strike essentially. And, you know, this was again during the election season and with the threat of uh, before the holidays and the threat of sort of economic paralysis. Um, so right. yeah, that's been the, you know, the pretty dramatic um, events of the the past year over this contract where we nearly had a, a rail strike and the um, general public, you know, were really woken up to the labor issues that railroad workers are facing and just the importance that, um, you know, how railroads really are yeah. so essential. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, that was something that I thought was kind of funny when I was covering all of this is you had all of this hype and negative energy coming from, you know, corporate media coming from a lot of politicians as well, who are basically saying, as you were just laying out there, right, we're heading into the holiday holidays, we don't want to have some sort of a, uh, you know, nationwide shutdown of our supply chains, and, uh, you know, have all of these uh, hiccups and uh, consequences as a result of that. But it's like, you know, the economic consequences or the threat of economic damages are kind of the entire point to going on strike in the first place, right? So it was kind of this weird disconnect where they weren't really understanding that that was, you know, where a lot of the leverage comes from these collective, uh, you know, uh, the, the workers basically standing up in solidarity and collectively organizing to make some of these demands. So I thought that part of it was uh, also kind of funny. But I mean, again, as you pointed out there, right, they had several different issues that they were mainly focusing on and that there were sort of disagreements on between a lot of these different unions between different individual union members and certainly between the uh, union representatives who were negotiating with the Biden administration versus the actual rank and file members within these unions. And so if you could, could you just expand a little bit in terms of why was there this disconnect? Why was the, you know, the, the rail representatives who were negotiating with the Biden administration, why did they have a different perspective on what was acceptable versus the rank and file members? Yeah, I mean, it's really that dynamic, you know, you see in a lot of unions, maybe most uh, major unions in the US and, you know, in other countries where um, just the way things have evolved over the years and, you know, the uh, the decline in union membership uh, or in unionization overall and, um, you know, really the economic crises where, you um, the government and and employers have you know sort of convinced unions that they're in this together and you know they need to make concessions or the plant's going to close or something often the plant does close um so anyway so you know it's the same thing that you see in other unions where um i mean unions are still so incredibly important and in a lot of ways powerful but it's it's come a long way in the wrong direction from the old days where you know right. unions really were fighting um, for the workers' rights and didn't have these too cozy or, or too comfortable uh, relationships with management. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I talk about on this channel sort of during the era of neoliberalism, predominantly since sort of the Reagan administration, you have just had this intentional destruction of labor unions in this country, of the working class more generally in this country, and sort of using a similar divide and conquer approach that a lot of these individual corporations try to use within the workforce when it comes to some of these labor disputes. But another thing is um, that you touched on when you were explaining previously sort of the run up to this entire thing was the specific surrounding this uh, 
precision, scheduling, railroading, and uh, sort of the staff shortages, some of the paid sick leave as well that a lot of these workers were trying to fight for that they inevitably didn't really get as a result of the you know Biden administration along with Congress sort of stepping in to prevent them from going on strike to make those demands. So could you just expand a little bit in terms of why those things were so important? Because you know the way that I see it, it you know paid sick leave is not just about you know having some some cushion there for each individual. It also plays, in my opinion, at least a direct role in terms of the safety outcomes or the lack of safety within the industry more generally, where if you are feeling pressured to go and, uh, you know, work some sort of a shift when you're sick or you're incapacitated in some other way, then that could potentially have safety consequences down the road. So could you just sort of like tie those together, some of the demands that a lot of these workers were and still are asking for right now and how that plays into, you know, a similar situation to what we just saw unfold in uh, East Palestine, Ohio? Yeah, yeah. So this um, precision scheduled railroading is this this uh, scheduling system that interestingly, not only the workers, but shippers have been really upset about, you right. know, the customers who ship stuff on the rails, um, because it's one of these things that in theory makes the railroads operate really well and helps you get your stuff where you want to get it. Um, you know, in the cheapest and quickest way, but in practice kind of plays out in the opposite way. And um, without getting into the weeds on it, uh, one of the ways this affects especially workers is, um, and this is all really driven, you know, by the bottom line for the freight railroad companies. Um, so they want to spend as little money as possible shipping stuff, you know, for as much revenue as possible. Right. Um, so what it's meant for workers um, in a lot of cases, especially on the, the two railroads that serve the western half of the U.S., BNSF and UP, um, and, you know, to a large degree on the other big railroads, too, from what I understand, is that workers are basically on call um, almost all the time. They may not be working. They may or may not be working really long hours, but they are like literally almost always on call. And um, in those two Western railroads in particular, they've been penalized if they turn down a call to come to work. They're penalized under this point system where they can get disciplined and, and then terminated really pretty quickly. So um, not only do they not really have sick days that, you know, the companies will argue they have some sick days. It's a little bit more complicated, but they mm -hmm. basically can't just take a sick day when they need to. And, um, you know, really probably even worse, they just almost can't have a life. Like it makes yeah. it really hard to to travel, you know, to do um, even to make appointments, even to make doctor's appointments. Um, right because they just don't know when they're going to have any free time. So, and then that, if you talk about health, like that takes a huge physical and uh, mental health toll, just living in that way. So, you know, it really, um, railroad, I mean, the jobs are, you know, pay pretty well, and it's a job that a lot of people love, but yet they've been, workers have been quitting at, and, um, you know, not feel, uh, positions aren't being filled because it's just become a really terrible job, largely because of this, this scheduling system. Right. No, I mean, it, it, you know, it's something that like, I think if you laid all of this out in the way that you are right now to the average American, they would say, yeah, I mean, this is completely ridiculous. No reasonable person should be expected to, you know, constantly be on call like this. There's no way you could have a social life or anything like that. And so I think that's, that's also an important thing to, to note in these conversations, right? Because it's not just about the economic consequences or, you know, the broader prospects of the American economy. I mean, these are also human beings, right? They want to live a, a decent life. You know, they're just average, you know, uh, you know, workers who want to be able to to get by and spend time with their family and do all of that stuff. So I think that's also, you know, a good a good thing to be talking about in this kind of a moment because these are real people who are, you know, in some cases even having their lives put in danger by the working conditions that they are subjected to. And as you pointed out, I mean, this all comes down to the fact that uh these rail companies which uh, you know, we have what four major rail companies in the United States that dominate uh different portions in the, you know, southeast, the uh, northeast, the the western portion of the United States as well. And um, you know, you have these monopoly monopolistic corporations who are dominating this industry. And they really, at the end of the day, only have one motivating factor, and that is to deliver maximum profits to their wealthy Wall Street shareholders. And that has so many other different like second and third order consequences and tangential effects, not just for the workers who work at these companies, but also for the broader implications of the American economy and for our supply chain broadly. And um, so if you could touch a little bit, you know, getting into this conversation about nationalization, 
organization? Like, why is this industry, why would anybody believe that this industry would be better suited to be in the hands of these Wall Street ghouls who are just trying to extract profits out of this system instead of reinvesting those profits back into the system and upgrading our rail lines and improving working conditions for all of these different rail workers, right? So could you just lay out sort of the basics of the argument that you were trying to put forward and that many other rail workers as well have been trying to put forward for the case for nationalizing this industry and just stripping away the profit motive? Well, you made the case really well right there. That kind of <laughs> sums it up, you know, for the <laughs> argument you. for, uh, yeah, and that applies to, um, you know, healthcare, education, a lot of these sectors that are partially or fully privatized. Absolutely. Or, you know, um, yeah, I mean, as you said so well on the most basic level, like why put massive, you know, why, why squeeze massive profits out of something when those profits, that revenue could be invested back in the system, including the workers, infrastructure, modernization. Um, so with rail in particular, uh, you know, there's, um, the, the, you could have more workers, you wouldn't have these worker shortages that uh, shippers are really complaining about. Um, you know, if you nationalize the system and rolled those profits back in, you could make rail, um, it already is really the most environmentally friendly form of mass freight shipping, but it could be much more so with more right. profits um, invested back in electrification and other environmental measures. And um, a lot of shippers have complained that the railroads are, you know, they find it hard or impossible to actually ship on the railroads because um, the, you know, the whole motive of, of doing only very profitable shipping as opposed to making it possible for, you know, any major, you um, shipper, you know, town or city to be served, uh, uh, the railroads are kind of curbing, actually curbing their service and the infrastructure they're using and abandoning lines that used to be used um, in the name of getting more streamlined and right. profitable. So, you know, that means the service is not as good um, as it could be. So, yeah, I mean, along with uh, just the, the kind of obvious argument of rolling revenue back into the actual system, um, you know, you also have this awkward system here where four companies own the tracks and Amtrak, you know, there's a whole other aspect of passenger rail. Amtrak operates on those tracks. So it's really right. hamstrung. By and they sort of, Amtrak has to give deference, right? They have sort of mm -hmm. a second priority to the actual freight rail that's running on some of the same lines that Amtrak runs on, which also has consequences for Amtrak or for passenger rail more generally in the United States, right? Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if the government ran the system, um, the public, you know, it, I mean, it would be essentially the government, but, um, remember that is us, the public. Yeah, it's uh, supposed to be at least. It's, yeah, it's yeah. supposed to be. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, then, I mean, it could be a disaster. You'd have to do it yeah. well, but, um, uh, you know, best case, there could be really logical, um, centralized planning where, you know, you would just make the investments where they're needed and you'd operate the system in the most equitable and efficient and fair way. And that would right. benefit everybody. Right. Absolutely. Well, I'm in full agreement with you. I think that this, you know, I think this is a great idea, but, you know, one of the, one of the terms you just used or just more broadly, when we talk about the, you know, word nationalization or central planning, as you just brought up there, right. Obviously I'm a, I'm a socialist. So there are many different industries that I think would be better operated under a democratic public, you know, ownership type of structure, as you mentioned earlier, whether that's healthcare, whether that's housing, whether that's the rail industry or energy system more broadly, but there is a huge contingent with in the United States that thinks these words like nationalization and the other ones are just like these scary words. They've been demonized throughout, you know, the modern history of the United States. And, you know, this is going against our, our capitalist economic model that has brought us all of this, you know, uh, you know, all of this economic success around the world and all of that. So how would you make the case to somebody who is skeptical of, you know, the government taking control of this industry, given the reality? And I think, you know, you may agree with this, you know, certainly I understand that I, the current status of our government, I mean, at least in my opinion, you know, a vast majority of our po politicians are essentially in the pocket, at least to some degree of corporate America, including the rail lines as well. And so there's a lot of distrust among the American public in terms of just, you know, saying, okay, well, we're just going to have the government operate this, you know, industry and they're just, they're going to do better, right? But how would you make that case to somebody who is skeptical of, you know, government corruption or their ability to maintain an industry like this or any industry broadly? How would you make the case to them that, you know, this different 
different type of structure within this specific industry. The rail lines will be better under public mm -hmm. ownership. Yeah, I mean, that's the key question. And those concerns are totally valid that a lot of people have. And there's also a lot of misinformation, like the people that say, you know, get the government out of Medicare, which of course is right. the government. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, people, you know, a lot of people don't really think about the fact that the government for the most part owns the highways and the waterways. And, you know, there's problems with those for sure. But uh, it does manage to operate those systems, which are pretty analogous to rail. And, um, you know, there's plenty of other systems that the government runs, um, sometimes badly sometimes very well uh and you know there's yeah definitely um potential for this to go really wrong under public ownership but that's where the implementation is so crucial and um Railroad Workers United, the independent labor group that has really been pushing the case for nationalization, um, they and you know other experts have called for um, not only public ownership but public ownership in a, a democrat you know with a, a democratic structure where there's something like a board of stakeholders where workers and the right. general public have representation and there's accountability built in and you know there's evidence based decision making and um, and, you know, of course, you'd want to have safeguards on corruption or a structure that discouraged corruption. So it definitely wouldn't be easy, but um, there's so many flaws and um, so many, uh, so much lost potential and harm actually being done by the current system that, you know, right. it seems worth the risk to try something new. Right. Yeah. I mean, definitely the the status quo is uh, not working out to say the least. And I think, you know, as you were sort of, uh, you know, as you were sort of getting to there, I think that the main thing that we're talking about here is just removing the profit incentive from this industry, right? I mean, that's where a lot of these issues come into play, because if you have a, a government, you know, democratically operated system with uh, input from the public directly, the communities that are affected by a lot of these decisions, you know, with input directly from experts in this field, as well as, you know, as a very key portion of this input directly from the workers themselves, which, you know, believe it or not, I think the actual rail workers would probably know a little bit more mm -hmm. about how to operate these rail lines than like Warren Buffett or some other Wall Street investors or something, right? They don't know anything about how the actual logistics work within this field, right? So I think that that would definitely be beneficial. And the other thing that you pointed out in your piece that I actually didn't know is that there has been some sort of, albeit temporary, historical precedent within the United States, as well as other countries around the world, even to this day, that have some form of publicly owned, uh, you know, uh, industries, whether that's the rail industry or other industries as well. But could you touch on just the the historical, you know, uh, through lines throughout American history? History. I think there was one that was back during World War One, if I'm not mistaken, where uh, it was temporarily nationalized. So could you just expand on how that worked out back then and uh, how that could potentially play into the, the current strategies towards trying to get something like that back up and running? Yeah, there's actually a, a many, many cases of, as you said, in most cases, temporary nationalization of uh, the railroads themselves and other industries like the mines and steel mills and factories. Um, so, you know, usually during sort of emergency situations, both during World War One and World War II, or immediately after um, the railroads were actually nationalized for periods of several years. And um, it went really well. Improvements were made in the system and the workers were treated better and uh, people were, you know, pretty happy with it. And um, especially after World War One, wanted that structure to continue. Um, and uh, yeah, during around the World War Two era, and also at other wartime and other points in history, there's just been um, hundreds of individual cases of nationalization. And, um, you know, it didn't dismantle our whole system. Maybe, maybe dismantle didn't tank our the whole American system economy good, but... <laughs> immediately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but um, no, it you know it was done relatively smoothly and with good results. And um, and even more recently during the economic crises, like when the Obama administration bailed out the insurance industry and the auto industry bailouts, um, you know, those have been referred to as nationalization and were in a sense that the government was taking control and was pumping all these public dollars into those sectors. Um, and then, you know, letting the, the private owners come back and reap all the benefits of right. that investment. Uh, so maybe not really fair <laughs> for the public, but um, yeah, so it's far from unprecedented. I mean, there's plenty of examples of different types of nationalization right. and, and current public ownership right. that are still going on. 
And and that's a that's a good point that you just brought up there with uh, the Obama administration and the health insurance companies is, you know, we've had some points in at least modern American history, like under the Obama administration, where they'll step into some of these economic catastrophes and, um, you know, basically bail out corporate America to a large extent without actually addressing the underlying core root of the problems that led to a lot of the, you know, whether it's the 08 financial crash or other, you know, pieces of or periods of economic tor- turmoil within the United States. And uh, basically just giving them a slush fund and in kind of a way like socializing the losses from these private enterprises and then turning around and allowing them to continue privatizing the gains, which is another thing, you know, that I noticed in this uh, Norfolk Southern disaster in East Palestine is it's like, you know, this community within East Palestine, they're going to be the ones who are going to have to pay really, whether it's, you know, with their actual lives or whether it's having to pay for healthcare down the line or all of these different things, they're going to be the ones who are going to have to pay for the mistakes and for the corruption from these rail industries or uh, from these rail companies, right? And so, you know, this is a, this is basically a question of if we are going to be continuing to give money to a lot of these different industries within the United States that continue to screw over average working class people, continue to decimate different communities, whether it's with rail spills or a whole bunch of other different tangential effects that come along with some of these economic, uh, you know, economic disastrous situations that we've had recently, you know, that's really the core root of the problem is that, you know, how are we actually going to bring this under public ownership in a way that is not only going to be socializing the losses, allowing these, you know, Wall Street ghouls to privatize the gains and walk out the back door with all of the money, but, you know, actually deliver on improvements to these industries via this democratic process and reinvesting this money back into these fields so that we can upgrade our infrastructure. And I mean, Obviously, in the United States, I mean, we have an absolutely atrocious infrastructure just just broadly across the country, not just with the rail lines, but across the board. I mean, we get you know graded uh, depending on the year between like you know a, a C minus to a D plus on our infrastructure, and we're living in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And so, you know, this seems to me like a pretty a simple solution to a problem that is very clearly being driven by corporate greed. And so, my follow up question, and this is going to be one of my last questions, I promise, I won't hold you for for too long. This has been a, a great conversation so far. But, you know, one of my last questions that I would ask is like, how do we actually strategically go about trying to implement something like this, right? From an external perspective of people who may be watching this video or, you know, whether it's the the actual rail workers themselves who are trying to organize and push for this through the RWU or through the, uh, the UE was another organization that has been pushing for nationalization. You know, how do we actually get this accomplished given the fact that, you know, we have a government right now, even under Democrats, that is essentially trying to uh, bust up these strikes and is certainly not standing firmly on the side of the workers, even though Biden wants to prance around as if he's the most pro-labor president in American history or something like that, right? How do we actually take on this fight and come out the other side victorious? Yeah, I mean, the first step and probably the most important and most exciting step is building um, a lot of public support and worker support for the concept and educating people. Railroad Workers United is just doing an amazing job furthering the the dialogue and doing public education and um, elevating the issue. And the UE also, the union, uh, so it has a Um, supported railroad nationalization. Um, And yeah, just the general public learning more about it and the the concept and just sort of having a a mind shift that, um, you know, this is something we deserve and can do and make sense. Um, And then pragmatically, you could talk a long time about how it would actually be carried out. But you know, the first step would be definitely having that public will there. Um, And then, you know, it would cost a lot of money, most likely, regardless, and that would be public money. Um, Companies would probably have to be paid. Um, Having the government nationalize the the tracks and still have private companies running the trains, you know, would be the more realistic scenario as opposed to the entire industry being nationalized. Um, But, you know, regardless, a lot of investment is going to be need to be made. But, you know, we find money for that kind of thing when it's necessary. And the, the uh, it would go back to benefit the public in the long term. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, it's it's not as if it's, you know, you're just dumping money into something that is not going to have economic benefits down the line. I mean, this is something where if you actually were reinvesting those profits back into the industry and electrifying our, you know, rail lines and making all of these infrastructure adjustments, that's something that's going to pay for itself down the line because you are expanding the economy, you're creating new jobs, you know, all of those different tangential effects that come along with that, right? So, um, you know, again, 
again, I mean, I think that you're 100% correct in your analysis of this situation. I'm glad that we actually have some reporters out there who are willing to actually, you know, speak to workers, see what their demands <laughs> are, and, um, you know, challenge corporate greed in a meaningful capacity. I mean, certainly, you know, the, the corporate press has not been doing that great of a job, to say the least, in covering the Ohio disaster and covering this issue more broadly, certainly not when, you know, the Biden administration was sabotaging the rail strike. But, you know, it's I'm glad that we have people like you who are out there who are covering this in a, a serious and in-depth way. And, um, you know, as you said, part of step one of this entire process of eventually working towards nationalization of this industry and many others as well, is just sort of trying to push this, this awareness of this as an actual viable policy solution and not something that's just, you know, pie in the sky, something that's unrealistic or something like that, but something that we not only should do and can do, but that we should honestly demand be done on behalf of these workers and on behalf of the broader American economy and the American people. And so, you know, I'm again, thankful for you to come onto this podcast for you to get a little bit more in depth on this subject. Again, I'm going to link that piece down in the description below for anybody who wants to go read through the entirety of it. Highly recommend it. But with that being said, again, I want to thank you for coming on the uh, coming on the podcast here. We've had Carrie Leiterson discussing, uh, you know, the prospects of something that hopefully we could potentially accomplish here in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. It was good to talk to you. Good to talk to you. Everyone is saying good politic guy has the best politic. Believe me, no one does it like you. Believe me, everyone is saying. Good